Hello everyone. Um, I just wanted to jump on before the podcast starts just to give you a prior warning that unfortunately, for a reason that I haven't been able to discern, Ronnie's video is a little jumpy. It's not particularly smooth. So you would notice that anyway. But I wanted to yep, give you a heads up. Obviously, if you find it too much, don't watch the video. But it's a wonderful conversation. So please don't miss out. Uh, and yeah, you'll enjoy whether you're watching it or listening to it. But yeah, just wanted to let you know. Okay, enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Active Inference Insights. I'm your host, as always, Darius Parvizi Wayne, and today I'm thrilled to be able to speak to Ronald Sladke. Ronnie is a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Vienna, Austria, where he teaches courses on cognitive science and predictive processing. His research focuses on the amygdala, as well as emotion processing and social cognition in the human brain. In addition to this, he has been part of a team developing real-time fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, where people can learn to regulate their own brain states while they are inside the MRI scanner. Ronnie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's, it's uh, really exciting to have a proper, full, fully-fledged neuroscientist on the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. So, you, you know... Part of the reason why I wanted to have you on is because you wrote this fascinating paper grounding what you called the amygdala complex in active inference. Uh, and I have plenty of questions about that. But before we actually go there, I thought an interesting starting point is that you, one very rarely meets people who teach active inference and predictive processing. Mm. Um, at least in my experience within universities, it's kind of like, oh, there's this little thing that started emerging and there are these kind of um, esoteric people studying. But let's not worry too much about that. Let's talk about reinforcement learning or, or something a little bit more accepted. What's the reception been like teaching predictive processing and active inference um, within your courses? Mm, okay, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, it only works uh, because of the master program that we have in Vienna. So we have an interdisciplinary master program in cognitive science. So I was one of the first students actually study this back in 2007, I think. And so it's located at the philosophy faculty, mm. but it's interdisciplinary. So we have some kind of core seminars and then uh, sent out to all the different institutes, say neuroscience or behavioral biology. And we just take lectures there and do our exams there and then come back to the philosophy uh, department and then try to integrate everything we've heard. So there has always been this kind of curiosity to say, okay, um, we take up students coming from different backgrounds with different bachelor degrees. So my bachelor is in, was in computer science. Um, and then we basically want them to reflect on the paradigms that they are using. So um, back then, uh, the most recent paradigm was actually for e-cognition and, yep. and from there we kind of moved on. And so they asked me to uh, teach now the uh, new trends in cognitive science uh, um, um, seminar. And this was then about predictive processing. Fantastic. What um, Around what year did they ask you to do that? So, I mean, I started with let's say predictive processing in about 2009 or something. Oh, wow. And so actually it was already inspired early on when, after reading uh, On Intelligence by Jeff Hawkins. Mm -hmm. So I stumbled on this book. It was, yeah, um, a little bit outside the typical canon on, in cognitive science, but I stumbled on it and I thought this idea very interesting, this idea of predictive coding. And... Um, then, yeah, um, the interest actually grew in 2009, 2010, and uh, I was kind of familiar with the early uh, writings of Carl Friston. And from there on, I started to tell people, hey, guys, you know, this is, I think, the next big paradigm. And at some point, I was able to convince people also to, uh, in Vienna to give me a course on this topic. And <laughs> it grew from there. And every year, I've got two, uh, 25 new students and teach them. Uh, wow. Processing. That's fantastic. Uh, that's super cool. I mean, I was at UCL, and again, I'm not going to bad mouth UCL. They gave me a very good education. This was for my master's. Uh, as I said, interestingly, although Carl's there and Chris Friff and all of these people who are very seminal in the creation of active inference, very little. So I think that's really encouraging that you guys are, are, are teaching it. Um, that said, obviously, there are some fantastic resources out there online, whether it's the textbook, whether it's uh, something like Ryan Smith's tutorial. 
I agree. Uh, but that's how have you seen the? I'm curious about how you've seen the kind of transformation in the acceptance of active inference as an idea. Because I presume back in sort of 2009, 2010, when people were still talking about feed forward models, um, you know, it was probably frowned upon that the brain was constructing its experience and there was a so-called controlled hallucination going on. So how, you know, what was that process like of people coming on, coming on side? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was somehow caught between the lines. So, I mean, uh, I was coming from my cognitive science background to say, okay, let's, um, you know, uh, get over with behaviorism and cognitivism even and, and you know, uh, move towards 4E cognition. But um, at the same time, I, I had a very hard time to actually apply this to my work then in cognitive neuroscience because yeah. after my master. Uh, program. I did a PhD in medical physics at the medical university. I was working together with physicists. We uh, mostly focused on uh, um, neuroimaging, but also uh, dynamic causal modeling. Then, mm. and uh, but they didn't really care for these ideas from cognitive science. I mean, those four E models that we tried to come up with back then. Quite honestly, they were very uh, uh, useless for cognitive neuroscience. <laughs> And um, so they always knew, okay, I'm the guy who knows how to code and because of my computer science background, I also worked in the industry. They knew that they could give me some data and then I will make sense of it. And this is how, how, how they basically um, yeah, um, handled me. Uh, but they knew that I had this kind of esoteric side coming from cognitive science, you know, always questioning the paradigms and, 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 and um, not thinking that the brain is just reactive. Right. And then at one point, I came up with um, with uh, my interest in, in uh, predictive processing, and finally, I mean, the big confirmation was when when people uh, like Carl and uh, Andy Clark also started talking about it. Then people uh, realized, oh, okay, it's not only Ronnie saying something <laughs> like this about predictive processing; it's also other people, and this is how it got a little bit more accepted. Right. But honestly, there were just basically two camps in in Vienna. One very much into this kind of neo behaviorism, and the other one more for E inspired in cognitive science. And I was caught in the middle, and now I, I try to, you know, bring those camps together. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, so that must have been what, sort of 2013, 2014, when the, you know, Andy Clark's book came out and whatever next was published. And I guess that's when all the buzz around predictive processing emerged. That's that's interesting. I, you know, it's, I love talk, talking about the actual ideas, but I'm also fascinated in the kind of meta aspect of people <laughs> fighting over their ideas. Um, so, so yeah, so we had sort of Fourie and then very strict computational counts and then active inference. It's just sticking with Fourie and active inference, because I feel like those are the two that are kind of spearheading cognitive science at the moment. Do you sense that they're compatible? Um, there's been a there's been a real tension, I would say, between sort of the traditional and activist cognition side and autopoetic side and more, let's say, representational forms of active inference. Where do you kind of see the middle ground there and, and their confluence? Mm. Yeah, I think they're totally compatible. I, I because I mean, like I said, I'm I'm coming from uh, autopoesis, and, and and this was 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 the big. The big motivation actually to seek out a, a kind of model that somehow, um, yeah, accommodates uh, the, the ideas of autopoiesis. And so it was only natural for me um, uh, to stumble on the free energy principle at some point and say, yeah, this is, this is how I think we can interface those, those ideas to basically have something tangible, to have something that can make experimental predictions um, in terms of you know, how you interpret behavioral data, but also neuroimaging data and so on. But at the same time, in its foundation is already also integrated in the ideas of uh, autopoiesis and um, yeah, self-regulation. So this was already fine for me from the start. And now what I learn is that there are some semantic differences, um, I would say, where people say, no, 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 this is not the kind of an activism and embodied cognition that we uh, want to have. And I, yeah, I mean, for me, those differences are not so severe, I would say. I, I would li like to leave this uh, debate to philosophers where you say, okay, this is maybe it's just my too sloppy reading of, uh, of the material. But um, 
in its foundation, I think it's totally compatible. And I think if we work together and get the semantics right and, and, and what we actually want to achieve, I think we can come up with a very nice unified model to uh, bring the whole economy of science together. Fantastic. I love the optimism. I share it because uh, I, I also love the earlier work of Varela and Roche and Thompson and then, you know, Varela's later work in the 90s actually trying to bridge the phenomenology with the neurology and the neuroscience. And I think all of that stuff is fascinating, uh, albeit incomplete. That, that, as you say, like we're still working towards those generative passages. But um, excellent. And, and, and it's funny that you did physics as well, right? Because then you fold in the kind of so-called high road to active inference and the Bayesian mechanics and the Fokker-Planck equation and the Langevin's. Was it cool to see all of that come into the picture, given your mathematical background? So I have to say I'm not a real physicist. I've worked with physicists, sure. so which means that all the ideas that I had, I always discussed in the, in our coffee room, and they always would give right. feedback on it. So it had to make sense in the physical world, but this doesn't necessarily mean that I understand what the fuck uh, uh, Planck equation is really about. Right. So um, yeah, I have to admit um, this is not my my uh, my biggest uh, expertise in the, the field. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Me neither. So let's not even go there. Um, I wanted to ask, again, before jumping onto the amygdala, um, I thought this real-time fMRI idea is fascinating. Um, and I was really, I guess it's not, it doesn't need to be too related to active inference. I guess the nice thing about this podcast is we can just, as I said before we went on, go wherever. Um, how does that work? And why was real-time fMRI a historical challenge was it just people just didn't think about it or did it prove uh challenging to um predecessors mm -hmm. so i mean first of all it takes quite some uh some time to, to process the fmri data so um uh i i think it goes back to the, like 2006 where the first people started to do real-time fmri um, and back then there were many pragmatic challenges back then. So how to get the images quickly off the scanner onto mm -hmm. some computer to do the analyses. And, um, these things have, um, yeah, been, uh, resolved over the next couple of years. So the scanner manufacturers were more accommodating to the researchers needs. And, and this was, this really improved the field. And then also, uh, data analysis and pre-processing. Um, it was, was, was very much improved by new methods to do it really in re real time. I mean, one fundamental problem that still exists is that there is this hemodynamic delay. So you always, when you do a functional MRI, um, you don't measure neural activity directly. You uh, measure the blood flow in the brain, yeah. which means there's always a delay by um, about six seconds uh, when you have the peak uh, of the hemodynamic response. And some people said, for philosophical reasons that this is much too late actually for somebody to interfere so mm. if you want to you know regulate your own brain then you will always see the uh the um the f um, the outcome of this regulation effort about six seconds uh later and so some people say okay i mean this means by principle real-time fMRI is impossible for for neurofeedback but um i don't I disagree. I think the um, humans are very good in association learning. I mean, they can uh, um, they can steer huge trucks, you know, trucks yeah, that yeah, are yeah. much larger than they are. They can uh, huge carrier ships whatsoever. So um, this is what you can basically learn by getting used uh, to the uh, to the task and um, and and yeah, getting getting a little bit of training. And when I wanted to do, when I was, when, when I was studying my PhD, uh, uh, program actually. So I had a job interview by my supervisor, Kristen Windischberger, a real hardcore fMRI physicist, uh, from, from the early days of fMRI actually. And he asked me, okay, so Ronnie, what would you like to do after all? So what, what, what is your career goal? Mm. And I said, oh, I really would like to learn this real time fMRI. And back then he said, no way. This is not going to work. No, there's so many technical challenges. And um, first, you should really learn yeah, proper fMRI and also a little bit dynamic causal modeling, uh, which was uh, quite on walk back then. Uh, back then. It, it came up as a new uh, method. And this was absolutely the right choice. So I didn't waste any time uh, during my PhD to, you know, 
uh, you know, spend endless uh, uh, time in the lab to really set up those those pipelines. So I waited a couple of years for my first uh, uh, postdoc abroad um, in in Zurich at the Buchherzli Clinic, um, where I had the opportunity to work with Frank Chernovsky, who was also at UCL um, at the Wellcome Trust Center, where he also was one of the pioneers of, of real-time fMRI. And this is where we started, and this is how we um, got it going. And we set up uh, a small uh, pilot uh, experiment, I would call it, so with different interventions where people had to regulate their own amygdala. So I'm, I'm always a little bit amygdala-centric. Wow. Uh, we instructed people inside the scanner to either up or down regulate their amygdala. And we used uh, emotional faces as feedback. So one instruction was, for example, to make um, neutral faces happy. So we used morphed faces and then they looked more and more happy. And uh, or to downregulate the amygdala by making uh, fearful faces less fearful. Mm. Cool. And so, so it's, you know, people, it's difficult, you know, as you know, as an experimentalist, it's hard sometimes to understand exactly what your participants are doing in a brain scan or when they're doing an experiment. I presume you were asking them questionnaires qualitative, like what tactic are you using? Because you've got this six second delay, but then you've also got this functional. So I was like, oh, you've got like, let's see how you're actually actively um, modulating the response of your amygdala. What kind of uh, reasons did people come up with, even if they're kind of spurious and, and post hoc? Yeah, uh, I mean, we... we... Uh, we didn't have a systematic way of asking those questions, but I wanted to um, do some quali uh, qualitative analysis of, of the data and, you know, just to collect some samples of what people are reporting, what kind of strategies they might be using or not. And so I always asked them how certain they were that they were performing well. And um, so this was, yeah, not not really indicative of their actual performance. So I, I remember this one particular participant, she was absolutely stunning. She was re really able to up or down regulate the amygdala at will. You could really see how the signals would go up, would go down again. So mm. you really like this textbook example, what you show in a post as a typical subject. And then we asked her, so how satisfied were you with your regulation effort? And she said, Oh no, it could have been better, and you know, I'm not sure. And um, when you also asked him for strategies, what kind of um, uh, strategies they used, it was also very hard to pinpoint because some people had really uh, good ideas. So some people had experience with meditation. Some, mm. um, some were m maybe a little bit from a psychology background and had some training uh, in, in psychotherapy. And they did, let's say. Um, um, different cognitive regulation mechanisms that a priori would make lots of sense, but they failed. On the other hand, we had some some guys from, um, let's say, from the ETH, so uh, from the technical university there, and uh, they said, yeah, without knowing anything about the brain, actually, they said, yeah, I was just lying there and thinking about playing basketball with this person I'm seeing. And this nice. for some reason. So, That's great. Um, so the only the only thing that um, that seemed to work was to consistently pay attention to uh, what you're doing. So if you're trying too hard, if you you know try to adapt a very complex regulation strategy or something, um, and you don't manage to focus your attention for the whole time, then it will not work. But if you're very consistent with your strategy, I think that the brain can also take care of the rest, maybe. Oh, this is okay. This is really cool. This is really interesting. I'd love to go a little bit further into this. Um, so just so I can get some sort of clarity on the paradigm, um, you're showing people these faces, some of which are you're expecting to uh, raise amygdala activity and others you're expecting to sort of downregulate amygdala activity. And so where does the self-regulation aspect come in? And um, they're not party to the actual inf the fMRI information of their amygdala. Is that right? Um, it is so. It is basically so they can see what's they can kind of see what's going on. And so why would so my question there is why would that person not think they're doing very well if they can see that their sort of conscious well again philosophically sticky words here but like their will their activity their attention is actually having this modulatory effect. So why would they have this like uh, this kind of self deprecating self re reflexivity? 
Mm. Yeah, it, it might be hard to really quantify how uh, and um, to really know how good you are in, in relationship to to, um, um, to other people, maybe, maybe because um, uh, yeah, they don't they don't have much experience with that, and they might sure. be a little bit dissatisfied if it takes longer than expected. If you know they try to focus, but they also see the signal going the other direction for a brief uh, moment. So this so it's very hard to tell actually. Okay, so people just have very high standards. Um, so, so okay, so let's let's just get some clarity on the paradigm. So we've got these faces, different faces. The so that's going to kind of um, exogenously affect the amygdala. But then you've got you've been telling these participants, okay, we want to see if you can contribute to that process. So let's say I'm looking at a happy face. Um, what would you be saying to the participant in that sort of context and what effects would you be hypothesizing that you might see? So what we know from the literature is that amygdala activity scales with the intensity of the emotions that someone is, is, is perceiving. And um, so what you see is there is already some kind of uh, um, uh, dependency of the stimulus that is shown and what, how the amygdala should respond. So in a way, what we talk about here is a closed loop between um, between the stimulus uh, that is also uh, um, uh, depending on the amygdala activity, and uh, you as the agent inside the MRI scanner are somehow in the position to manipulate on that. So find a way to to influence this closed loop between what the amygdala is doing in processing the faces and what is actually presented. And uh, I mean, this was without much t theory, actually. So there are uh, control theoretical assumptions uh, on that, that you're somehow regulating uh, this, uh, this closed loop. But um, at, some, at some point, we could also come up with an active inference model, actually, of what might be going on there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely lends itself to a kind of hierarchical modeling perspective where you have kind of higher order constraints. I guess it was the... Uh, was the role of the kind of endogenous attention or endogenous will to always like oppose the closed loop. So if, for example, I'm seeing a very fearful face, so we're expecting this to correlate with increased amygdala activity, would it always, would the task always be, well, try and deregulate uh, or, or downregulate the activity of your amygdala? And maybe if it was, again, I'm just asking, I wasn't there. Uh, but if, uh, if they're sort of, Minimal activity because you're just seeing a very neutral face. You might say, "Well, try and try and spike it." Was it always kind of doing the inverse of what might be happening endogenously? Mm, no, we actually did several interventions with that. What we okay. found what was working best was actually to either downregulate the amygdala to make fearful faces less fearful and um, neutral faces more happy by upregulating the amygdala. So nice. if, if it was um, somehow consistent with uh, with these natural tendencies. Um, then, uh, then it would work best, I would say. Wow, this is, I really like this. This is cool. So, um, as you say, it kind of lends itself to this active inference hierarchical perspective. I believe you did, I know this is a weird thing, but obviously I search up everyone I'm speaking to just so I can do my intro and stuff. And I think I saw that you did some work on Schopenhauer. <laughs> um, I know, it was a long time ago, but it was your master's work right that's that's right yeah <laughs> Schopen, schopenhauer does you know schopenhauer focuses very much on the will what i mean this question just came to me so it sounds very contrived and but it really isn't um what role would you say th this points you know for a kind of naive audience or folk psychology audience it might sound well of course this is just the will this is me doing it this is like purposeful activity and I can control my thoughts and I can control my actions and so on. What, what do you see being the kind of uh, operating uh, function or operating mechanism in play here in terms of top-down regulation? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, so when it comes to the brain now, um, I would say uh, it has something to do with prefrontal control of the amygdala. Uh, if we talk about yeah more um, metaphysical uh, accounts of what Schopenhauer could give with his metaphysical will, I mean a short explanation for this because this is yeah as, as he said this was my master thesis and I stumbled on Schopenhauer while um, 
I'm reading a little bit of uh, uh, philosophical literature in my third and fourth semester in my uh, cognitive mm -hmm. science studies. So Wittgenstein, but also Schopenhauer then. And I was really fascinated by how many interesting ideas he already had in the um, 19th century. And I thought that many of the uh, things that he was talking about are still state-of-the-art discussions in cognitive science. And that's why I, I tried to, you know, apply some of his ideas to um, to current problems that we have. And that's why I called my master thesis Schopenhauer's Last Will. <laughs> and um, it's not very good philosophically speaking because I'm not a trained philosopher, but it was uh, it, it was very interesting uh, actually to uh, to step into this debate and discuss with philosophers about it. And this was, was really informative, but this was kind of a, a uh, singular point in my uh, history before I moved on again to the more empirical, more uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience side of cognitive science. But let's talk about the will now and the way I yep. interpret Schopenhauer. So, I mean, at one point, I really want to take a philosopher in and write a proper paper about it. But uh, I think Schopenhauer had lots of interesting things to say um, that are still relevant for active inference as well, because he talked about two things, about representations and will. The world is mm -hmm. a real representation. And representations um, have a lot to do with the models that we are using uh, in, in cognitive science. So he didn't use, of course, representation in this loaded fashion that, um, that we now have in cognitive science where there are representation wars. Um, but uh, it was uh, the, 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 the German word of representation would be Vorstellung, which is like an imagination. So there is some kind of um, uh, imagination going on that are used to actually uh, model the world. So we cannot mm. access, uh, access the world directly. So he was very much influenced by Kant. Um, there is only the, the, only the consequences, the phenomena are, are somehow uh, reachable to us. And based on that, we form imaginations, representations of the world. And for him, of course, this was not enough. And I mean, when we now translate it also to predictive processing, we see, okay, just, you know, sam uh, yeah, collecting samples of the world and compiling it somehow, this would be very passive uh, predictive coding without any intention, without life. It is just a way of, of storing data. And so Schopenhauer already needed to have this kind of second uh, uh, power at, uh, at work, and this would be the will. And the will was nothing um, metaphorical. Um, metaphysically rich in the sense that there is some uh, God and its will and uh, it has some, some yeah, it was more a force of nature, very much mm. undirected. So you would say on the most primitive level, um, it's, it's the laws of nature uh, that are a manifestation of this will. And then when you go up uh, on, uh, on living system, in, the, in the hierarchy of living systems, he had this very strong hierarchical view. You see that plants somehow manage to fight against gravity because they are growing upwards and, and you, you get from there to animals and then uh, human beings. But in essence, they are a manifestation of the same will, of the same um, force of life, or maybe of the same principles that we have in nature. When we think of thermodynamics, for example, we need to find a way to fight the second law of thermodynamics, right? And these mechanisms um, could uh, could be yeah could link to this very metaphorical idea of will. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, the, the notion of a will, especially with a six second delay, <laughs> is, uh, is tricky, right? Um, philosophically. But I think it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a redundant question. Some philosophers, you know, the really strict materialist might just say, well, it, it is just the prefrontal cortex. Uh, but at least on this podcast, I don't hold any ontological requirements. So if you wanted to say that it's a panpsychist proto agent, or if you wanted to say it's God, I'm, 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 I'm going to entertain it. <laughs> but at least in terms well, of the I, I, what I would like to say to be a little bit more precise about my idea of, of free will, it's not necessarily you know philosophers somehow like to de uh, detach the actual problem of living systems to very abstract spaces where mm. time doesn't play a role. And for me, a six seconds delay are um, is not really a, a a problem because mm. I think uh, that 
uh, agency has noth nothing to do with, uh, you know, momentum uh, on the level of moment to moment, but also in the level of the process that sure. you are causing something, you, you see the outcome of your actions. You might not be even aware of, uh, um, of, of the behavior that uh, gave rise to these outcomes, but then you evaluate the outcomes and then you learn from it and then you adjust your behavior. Mm. I think uh, in, in this kind of ballpark, this is where most of free will actually happens because most of the behavior that we do is automatic and, and for good reasons, because it's efficient and fast. But over your yeah, continuous uh, effort, you're able to uh, steer um, yourself uh, also when you have very delayed feedback, like in, in your feedback. Yes. Yes. I think, I think a lot of these sort of broader philosophical questions are underpinned by your like resting axiom if you're taking the notion of a substantial self a cartesian dualistic self then sure like it, it, it the time probably doesn't matter right there might just be a delay but if you're just taking the neurophysiological mechanisms well then we're not going to get off the ground by even talking about you're recognizing the consequences of your own action I think it's funny because Schopenhauer also said, I believe, uh, a man can do what he wills, but he can't will what he wills, <laughs> which is just a beautiful refutation to kind of soft determinism. I always thought it was the best refutation of soft determinism, which is like, yeah, yeah, like I'm doing what I want, but I'm like, well, why did you choose this? The, you know, why did you choose what you wanted? And you run that infinite regress and. Yeah, it was, it was a brilliant writing. It was really, really great in um, you know making really good points, really, uh, um, uh, really uh, high in rhetorics and everything. Uh, but the point was, I, I think that he was misguided in, in a couple of ways, and mm -hmm. I, I think it has something to do with his lifestyle. He was he was a very odd person. He was living alone. He didn't have um, much social interactions and. Uh, also, he was very mean to friends and people interested in him. So, um, yeah, never a family, never a relationship whatsoever. So mm. I, I think he has had a um, very depressive uh, deposition. And um, and I think, so, I mean, this is what now uh, now we move back into, into, uh, the, into the clinical neuroscience domain. Maybe when we look at people uh, with uh, depressive symptoms, they also tend uh, uh, to be more um, uh, incompatibilistic with their beliefs about free will. So they they also feel that they are uh, less able to you know control their life. They are more uh, basically driven by external factors. Right. So there could be this interesting relationship there as well. Oh yeah. Other, no. mm, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. And so, because I mean, it was kind of a dead end for him. In life. It was always. Uh, it was. It was always governed by external factors, and there was no way out. And um, this. It. This drove him to this extremely strong nihilism, and also his uh, idea of antinatalism. Actually, it's better to um, not have any, you know, offsprings at all, and to die out at one point. So it's very dark, very um, uh, um, nihilistic, and this is definitely the side that I don't like about it. Um, yeah. Well, also, his disregard for women. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were all pretty rubbish in that domain, I think. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can kind of, we can, in some sense, those elements of those philosophers, um, the disparaging attitudes towards women, just kind of that element dooms them all. Uh, I'm not sure Schopenhauer is an exemption to that. I mean, of course, there are some who are a bit nicer, but I think they were all pretty twatty in that <laughs> domain. So that's not great. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, you, you hear this stuff about sort of uh, locus of control, internal versus external locus of control, and its correlates with um, meaning in life and, and depression and stuff like that. I think what's interesting there is that even to make that point, just on a philosophical basis, you're, 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 still, you're still investing in this kind of physicalist axiom, which I just don't think is particularly well substantiated by science or by philosophy or by whatever. I, it, you know, this notion that, well, we, we just don't know um, because we have this remarkable ability to be subjectively aware of things and have intentional stances on things. And, well, Ronnie, if you can find the person who can explain that to me, then you win, right? And I'll become Schopenhauer and nihilistic. But until then, I'm quite happy to sort of bathe in the, the loveliness of that mystery. And I wonder whether if Schopenhauer had read Thomas Nagel 
or David Chalmers, whether he would have been a bit more optimistic. But, you know, I think you sense a lot of this in this uh, the scientific turn in the 19th century, uh, yeah, uh, and the 20th century, this, this gross nihilism, which obviously uh, Nietzsche basically foretold more than anyone. So uh, this is interesting. I mean, so I think this your your integration here of the therapeutic landscape is interesting as well, because, you know, this is very broad brush and rough. But a lot of therapy, especially for something like an anxiety disorder, will be will, will look something like reestablishing the prefrontal cortex as the master over the amygdala. So I'm worried that the world is going to fall down or the plane is going to crash or, well, like, you know, that's why people like vagus nerve breathing, but let's reestablish the role of the prefrontal cortex to moderate and regulate uh, that overactivity. But it almost sounds like, okay, if we focus so much on that neuroanatomy, we almost lead into a nihilism because well, the prefrontal cortex isn't me, right? If you showed me my little flesh of prefrontal cortex, I wouldn't say, oh, well, that's my will, that's my desire, that's my capacity for regulation. So what was your experience when you saw that people were able to regulate their amygdala, uh, regulate their emotions? Was it liberating for them or were they kind of spooked out? <laughs> so yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um so, yeah, because this is actually where, where I'm also coming from. I always thought of uh, the amygdala being regulated by the prefrontal cortex. So uh, uh, this was also my main focus in my PhD thesis. I worked with people with social anxiety disorders. And um, you could see in neurotypical people that uh, when they were watching emotional faces, they were able to downregulate their amygdala. Um, by, uh, by, by a small region called the medial orbital frontal cortex. And precisely this mechanism was not functioning so well mm. in uh, people with social anxiety disorder. And in another study where people were uh, given uh, SSRIs, so antidepressant uh, medication, uh, they were able to have stronger down regulation of the amygdala by the orbital frontal cortex. So this very much played into uh, uh, into this kind of narrative, and this is also what we find in the neurofeedback study that uh, people who regulate the amygdala also have stronger influence uh, of the uh, of the prefrontal cortex on the amygdala. So this kind of uh, of works. It it it. it um, it has something uh, also to do with uh, with the uh, studies on um, uh, cognitive uh, effort and how people are doing cognitive reappraisal and then are able to uh, regulate subcortical areas by using mm. prefrontal areas. So this kind of network. But you're cool. right. This is not the full story. Yes. Well, we can't. We can, we, yeah, we'll move on. But I guess I'm, I'm really just trying to ram home. We can't discard the phenomenology. Uh, and as a 4E man, I'm sure you'll 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 agree. Yeah, that's... but you see where my problem actually is. So uh, I, I I kind of accepted this kind of narrative that we use in, in clinical neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience to uh, model amygdala connectivity. Right. And um, what I've been actually struggling with the um, uh, with the topic of amygdala and active entrance was for many years so like more than 10 years i was not able to basically bring those two together i i mm -hmm. knew that i was a molecular researcher uh, researcher during the week and on the weekend i could think about active inference but those were things that were highly compartmentalized i couldn't bring them together uh why because i mean it was you, you could say, okay, I have to think about top-down control of the amygdala. But like you said, I was not happy just to say, okay, it should have something to do with the um, with the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex regulating. But yeah, there is more to that. You mentioned um, breathing. You mm. basically a link also to uh, interceptive processes mm. that they will regulate also the amygdala. So if you are uh, if you have a panic attack, it has nothing to do with what you're thinking. You're experiencing that you're losing control of your body, and this alone is enough. It has nothing to do with some kind of abstract reasoning that you're yeah. not doing. It is an embodied process that should play a role. So um, then the other thing is, uh, so it has something to do with the insular cortex then maybe, or it has right. something to do also with uh, brainstem input into the amygdala. Um, the other thing is then also reward processing because um, 
much of the debate is, is focused on, on uh, fear conditioning experiments in animals because it works so nicely. Uh, and this is where you say, okay, this is, um, this is the function of the amygdala. It's about fear and threat processing or something. And even in my, um, in my PhD thesis, I wrote about also the, uh, you know, that amygdala all responds to positive emotions. And I had a big fight with one of the uh, reviewers of my PhD thesis because I said, no, the amygdala is just for fear even though mm. it was already outdated this kind of view back then. But yeah, nowadays we know so much more also from animal experiments that um, the amygdala is, is heavily connected with the ventral strait. And so it has a lot to do with, you know, uh, making decisions about uh, risk and rewards and balancing right. uh, those. And um, so we now know from the animal models, very precise mapping. So those, those circuits definitely exist somehow. And, so this is another conundrum then. So where should I start to actually uh, draw the top level of the hierarchy? You say, okay, this, okay, the amygdala is driven by reward. No, we could also say that no, the amygdala is uh, driven by interception. And uh, therefore, I kind of failed to come up with a way to start my active inference model. And this shifted then uh, a little bit later when I had this insight for, for the transient cognitive science paper. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll certainly come to the text paper. I guess one thing... I, yeah, one interesting addition to this uh, conversation that the, pre, the the loop between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is not enough is OCD. Mm. And OCD is interesting because it was cast as an anxiety disorder. And this, you know, and, and so you would say, okay, well, cognitive behavioral therapy is about reinstating the role of the prefrontal cortex, but OCD actually involves hyperactivity of the orbitofrontal cortex. And so, and how that maps onto therapeutic, you know, therapeutically is. They'll say, don't do logicking, don't do rumination, don't do, don't logic your way out of um, a problem, mm -hmm. right? That's actually worsening the problem. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what's odd is that in many ways, the symptoms of OCD are very similar to the symptoms of something like GAD or generalized anxiety disorder. And yet it seems like there's the inverse relationship or the inverse problem where you have hyperactivity over the uh, frontal cortex and so you have stuff like tms or in, you know intrusive lectures going in there and actually trying to deregulate that process mm -hmm. so it's um it's a mystery but as you say it's it, it of course it's a mystery because it's you know hundreds of millions of years old it would be lovely if it was just one loop uh but alas okay so let's um let's jump to this text paper um your trends in cognitive science paper on the amygdala so you called it the amygdala complex, which I really liked. Uh, I thought it was kind of, it sounded kind of Victorian. Um, <laughs> before you fold an active inference into the amygdala, you mentioned that, you, you know, one of your reviewers, your PhD went, well, amygdalas are only for fear. What are the other kind of uh, preconceptions that historically have held about the amygdala? I would say that there is only one amygdala. But essentially, what's, what's very important is, I mean, of course, there are two, they're, they're bilateral, uh, but um, even more important than lateralization is that the amygdala consists of at least two completely different nuclei. And the one would be the central amygdala and the other one, um, the basolateral complex. So these are actually two different um, nuclei that somehow are fused together over, uh, um, over time. And the origin of the central uh, amygdala is actually the, the ventral stratum. And while the uh, basal and lateral part of the amygdala are actually more uh, cortical-like in structure. Mm. So this was this is this is an important game changer already. I mean, many people in the um, in the rodent literature know about this. I mean, they they map the differences between central amygdala, medial amygdala, all the different parts of the basolateral uh, complex, and uh, they're totally familiar with that. But in human neuroimaging, we mostly focus on the whole amygdala or just some active voxels within the gross neighborhood of where the amygdala might be or something. So it's it's um, it's very unclear when we look at the neuroimaging uh, data what we actually mean when we talk about the amygdala because uh, many groups are talking about different things. And it may be worth just unpicking for the non-trained audience when you say so the central amygdala. Um, well, actually, I guess people are coming from an active inference hierarchy. So when I was reading, I was thinking, okay, the central amygdala is higher up the hierarchy. Uh, and provides predictions to the basal lateral area. 
Mm -hmm. But when you say, okay, it emerges from the ventral striatum, so it has something to do with motivation and reward, and the basolateral feeds back into the sensory cortex. If we now feed in these classic terms of perception and action, which are kind of the currency of active inference, what does that say more broadly about these different bits, if mm -hmm. that's a feasible distinction? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's start maybe with the, um, with the different con historical views. So let's say... Um, the uh, simple human neuroimaging view might be the amygdala is something like a fear detector or emotion detector or relevance detector, something something like this. And if, uh, you know, let's say, a, a new emotional phases pops up, then the amygdala would increase its activity. This is the a traditional view in neuroimaging and many experiments are done this way. And they're, yeah, sometimes really good experiments and you can learn a lot. Um, from this kind of amygdala reactivity. The more nuanced view is nowadays in neuroscience would be to say, okay, let's look at the different subnuclei, um, let's say in a mouse model, for example, to say, okay, we have the basolateral amygdala at one end, at the lateral end of the uh, basolateral amygdala, you have unimodal inputs, mm -hmm. and those are integrated uh, towards um, uh, the uh, more basal part and become uh, multimodal. Uh, um, uh, into integrated uh, stimuli, and uh, from there there is an um, there is a connection to the central amygdala, and the central amygdala would then be the output region. So there is some kind of gating that is modulated by, let's say, ventral stratum or prefrontal cortex or whatever, and um, there basically decisions are made if uh, you should show some kind of uh, stereotypical uh, threat response like um, finching behavior or fighting or, or running away. So it um, very much um, depends on the context, what kind of behavior is actually uh, used to get away from this kind of situation. And this sure. is the mainstream view. Yeah. What I try to do is then to, to basically flip it around, to say, no, central amygdala is not uh, um, just receiving the uh, the signal, but it is actually the one that is on top of the hierarchy and sending down predictions to the base of natural amygdala. And do you, so, yeah, that's great. So do you then uh, reconfigure or recast this gating mechanism as a contextualization mechanism? Would that be fair? Would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of the things that are, we are saying in this paper are very compatible with, uh, with what people already know. So many people who follow the classical feed forward perspective would say, yeah, of course, what uh, uh, the output of the central amygdala is additionally gated by input from insular PFC, ventral mm -hmm. spectrum, and potentially also other areas. And um, so this already um, already is there. But for me, the big question was actually, but how does the basolateral amygdala know what kind of data to forward to the central amygdala? So what is relevant for the, for the central amygdala? And this big question of meaning and relevance, this is something that is not answered in the classical feed-forward uh, paradigm. This is what we had to change. So it's worth pointing out there that the transmission of information from the unimodal to the multimodal to something like the abstract level at the central amygdala is not necessarily it, it doesn't it doesn't it's not like a replication process there's some like stripping out of information as it gets passed up the hierarchy is that is that is that fair in terms of relevance meaning and yeah i mean personal relevance right it's it's going to be individual specific what it, 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 do you therefore suggest that those non relevant stimuli just get as we say explained away yeah, exactly. So it's it's a kind of abstraction gradient, as I like to call it. So you, you get away from very concrete uh, sensory features more to something uh, uh, generalized uh, that is maybe even detached from the context it is uh, uh, longer also in time and, and um, so, so in the temporal dynamics, actually. So you... Uh, um, so you explain smaller stimulus features to fluctuate more uh, mm -hmm. uh, more quickly than um, you know the object identity, for example, or right. the, the affective state that you are in, where you think that you are currently under threat, or uh, even that you're in a, a constant state of anxiety, for example. Yeah. So so we can so just for like 
yeah, just for myself and the audience, it's kind of this idea that we have these slower contextual fluctuations which can regulate the faster fluctuations. So maybe maybe an example would be worth using here. So I, I like I really like your example. I actually used it as well, and I genuinely did not take it. I just uh, it may have been something that Carl mentioned, but it's the kind of snake on the lawn, rope on the lawn dichotomy. So you have a rope in your lawn, and it's kind of curled up in the grass, so you don't know whether it's a snake or not. Now your lower level parts of the amygdala are just responding to the sensory input, which is snake-like, right? The curledness, the texture. But then you have this uh, higher order contextual prior that, no, you're in your garden, right? So you're in Austria, I'm in London. Like, we, we don't have snakes. What? Where do you find that, that um, those two meet and therefore the prediction error uh, gets suppressed? Is that in the central amygdala or is that higher up? Mm -hmm. So, I would say that um, the central amygdala has more uh, something to do with uh, having a general feeling of how safe you are at the moment. Mm. Safe also in terms of how well you are regulated and how well you expect to be regulated in the future. So, if you're experiencing pain or death in the near future, then you're not safe. Then this is something right. you should be afraid of. And this is where I think the uh, central amygdala plays a role. So if there is mm, sufficient uh, contextual evidence that, uh, okay, you are in a tropical jungle and there might be snakes out there, um, then you're, of course, more on the edge. So and this would mean that you're upregulating uh, uh, those parts of the amygdala, the vasolateral amygdala, that is very good in detecting those, uh, those snakes. While when you are in a safe context, when you are sailing, this is the ex uh, example that I'm, I'm, I'm using in, in, in the paper, mm. you, know, the boat, you know that there are many ropes lying around, but there are <laughs> usually no snakes. Um, then uh, you should be actually quite at ease and, and not uh, misinterpret all coiled uh, snake-like objects as snakes. Yeah, and I think I think this is really I think this is really interesting because I think it's an area that actually I've, I've been talking to some people about this. The fact that I don't think these attentional mechanisms are actually that well articulated in active inference literature. There are some wonderful papers. I keep pointing people in the uh, pay, uh, direction of uh, Mirza and his papers on attention with Carl and others. But I think this is a really interesting point because I view attention in some way as a uh, as a mental action which involves priors. And so for me, I, when I talk about the priors in terms of attention, for me, it's like, okay, we, we recognize through these uh, slower contextual cues where you are, and that constitutes um, sort of, as you say, pr there's priors involved here in the down regulation of gain control or the down weighting of precision weighting over anything which might fit the template of a snake. But then people, I guess, generally think of that in terms of the likelihood distribution, right? So what are the, you know, given my state, what's the likelihood of having this observation of a, uh, a snake? But for us, we're kind of saying, well, actually, this might be constrained by a higher order uh, action policy. Maybe it's worth unpicking, because I think one reason I really, really liked your paper, and I think it's a really fascinating paper, is because I think more than anyone I've actually ever read, you unpicked the problem with the ambiguity of the term prior. So you say there are two types of priors. There's kind of the phenotypic prior or what you call the preferred prior, I believe. Mm, preference prior. Mm -hmm. Preference prior. Very good. And then you talk about the priors aiding perception. So kind of the, uh, the priors I've been talking about here in terms of um, suppressing prediction error um, and then also belief updating. So maybe it's worth putting on your teaching hat and just saying, okay, we can keep using the snake example. For people who are very confused at this point because they're like, why are we using the word prior for these things? Maybe it's worth you un helping us sort of unpick those two senses of the word prior. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes very liberal with using uh, the word prior. And, you know, this comes actually from this kind of science debate of whether you have a model or you are yeah. a model. And I think it's it's usually both. So uh, metaphorically, we can say that our body and uh, yeah, the, the fact that our body works in this kind of environment that it it is a very good model on mm -hmm. uh, on its environment. And I think the same also applies for priors. I think you are able to 
um, construct uh, priors that you are able to um, to uh, introspectively assess and also report and, and, and do reasoning about it. But I think that some priors are just, let's say, hardwired. Mm-hmm. In a way, I sometimes do uh, use this as an example uh, for my students. I would say that even the bone structure, the skull, yeah. these are also priors in a way. They're very inflexible, highly precise priors, but in a way they allow us, the whole organism, to do inference about the world. Right. And then maybe cost differentiating that from uh, the second type, where you say that these priors, and here I can quote, aid perception by guiding attention, enhancing the relevant signal features, and suppressing noise in sensations. How? So that's one side, the homeostatic priors, the preference priors, these are somewhat fixed unless you're sleeping and you can let your body temperature go down but that that aside they're somewhat fixed how what's the difference between those and these priors involved in perceptual belief updating Mm -hmm. right i mean i I always like to make this distinction um between uh creative coding and Mm -hmm. Um, predictive processing or active inference. So maybe some of my students are watching now and this is a typical exam question that I like to give for the master's uh, defense year. Oh, I'm so jealous of these, <laughs> of these kids. Oh, I'm a kid as well, am I talking about? But I'm so jealous of the exam <laughs> question. So, I mean, difference is now, uh, perceptual priors can be seen in this uh, very stupid uh, predictive coding way. So you have just a system that just tries to absorb uh, the environment as it is to minimize uh, the, the, the difference between what is actually sensed and, mm-hmm. and what it already knows. So this is mm-hmm. predictive coding, not, nothing really interesting, so to speak. From from the uh, from, from 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 cognitive science or from this idea of organizing a living system, I think the interesting point comes if you say no. It's not only about updating uh, uh, your Bayesian beliefs; it's also about uh, Bayesian regulation. And this is another formalism, basically, that you can easily introduce uh, into the whole idea of uh, uh, of Bayesian processing by saying no. Some of the priors they don't update. Yeah. They are fixed. So in terms of perception, this is uh, to give you a very simple example. You might have the idea that there could be a snake out somewhere. You take a look around and you don't see any snake. So you update your prior belief. Okay, well, I heard something, but there is no snake. So this mm. is okay. So it's easy to update those very flexible priors. Um, but there are some priors that have to be uh, more or less fixed, and that's, for example, ideal uh, body temperature or blood oxygenation, for example. Right. This, sometimes I hear uh, as a criticism of people who are not familiar with predictive processing to say, oh, wait, why don't you just update your prediction that you're... Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you'll die. <laughs> of course, you die. And this has something to do with uh, um, fixed preferences that you have. Mm. And so there is no way of actually reducing prediction error. And I think having prediction error on, 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 uh, on some levels of, of, your, uh, of your hierarchy, and this is something that we have to learn uh, and figure out experimentally in the future where it actually, where it actually plays the biggest role, uh, leads to the feeling of uh, negative valence. So if there is prediction error that you cannot minimize, it doesn't feel right. There is something mm. something very wrong mm. about it. So the only thing, and this now closes the loop, how you can actually uh, minimize the prediction error between your sensations that you're having, for example, too little oxygen, and your homeostatic set points, your preference prior, <laughs> is by doing actions. You right. can, you know, uh, breathe again. You can, if you're too cold, you can put on a jacket. So um, this is how action is the only way of actually making this right again. Yeah, yeah. And as I've said to my audience on many times, this is perfectly cast within the variational free energy um, equation itself, right? You're reducing KL divergence, recognition density, and the true posterior, and then also maximizing model evidence. I guess so. two things come to my mind here. The first is that we also talk about now we're using these POMDP schemes and Bayes graphs. We also talk about priors over um, states or, 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 and priors over paths and priors over actions. So we're talking about you know, preferences, uh, sensory, preferred sensory observations of my action, or we're talking about state transitions, and we're talking about e, you know, the E-tensor, we're talking about habits. So 
I guess the reason why I bring that up is because for me, it's an incomplete picture without mentioning that because in many ways, right, I might, for me, I actually think it's important to divorce these different types of priors because without that, I might say, well, I have an inflexible, if I, if I say that they're all one type, I have this inflexible prior that I don't want to be around snakes. But that means that I get this perceptual information, right, with precise uh, likelihood distribution that I'm probably, you know, the, this observation is quite likely given that there's a snake, but I don't uh, update that prior. So I'm in real trouble, right, because there's a snake, but I'm not updating it. But I guess the point here is, well, if I recognize at the higher level of the uh, hierarchy that I am in a jungle, for example, I can now start doing this mental action where I, through my mental action, increase gain control over the likelihood distribution, the A matrix, and downregulate my uh, prior, right? That doesn't mean that I discard my homeostatic requirements. It just means it's more likely that there's going to be a snake and that I'm going to respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, I think a really useful piece of terminology here actually comes from Sam Jeev Nangoshi, who, who works at Versus and is writing this textbook on Bayesian mechanics, because he talks about uh, perceptual priors and what he calls autonomous priors. And these autonomous priors are these like genetically uh, determined or, or, or very, you know, deep rooted learned cultural priors, which as you say, are super high precision and um, not affected by the idiosyncratic context in which we find ourselves. So maybe it's, it's, it's worth picking up here the role of attention uh, and talking about the sort of hierarchy here, the picture that I've laid out, does that, does that sound okay? And does it kind of conflate issues by adding in like a third type of prior, which are the priors over action? No, I don't think so. I, I think it totally makes sense. Um, so, I mean, the amygdala uh, cannot solve all the problems on its own. So it has right. to be somehow integrated in that. I mean, this is, this is what we, uh, how we also try to reframe this whole idea of um, uh, of seeing the central amygdala as the only output region. I think that every part of the amygdala has its output um, mm -hmm. that play a relevance here in this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, um, perceptual and action hierarchy. So the thing is, when you um, when you when you talk about attention, I think that uh, predictions from uh, the uh, lateral amygdala to the unimodal cortices, for example, um, they upregulate uh, uh, areas there to be more uh, sensitive towards uh, incoming stimuli. So this is also a kind of um, uh, neural gain control has something to do with uh, attentional processes. Uh, this, uh, the same also for the central amygdala. It's not only for for actions, but also uh, regulating uh, arousal through uh, through the whole body. So if it's upregulating arousal. Um, then uh, your whole uh, physiology changes. Your mm. vision, uh, the way you sample the world, totally changes as a top-down phenomenon. Your um, um, your way of how you is, um, yeah, integrate interceptive feelings in your body as well. So uh, I think there is not just one attention mechanism. I think attention is also a very multi-level process, and it's not only the kind of attention that we like to think of as um, conscious mental action that we also can do on this kind of uh, agent uh, personal level. But I think there are many uh, sub-personal uh, uh, aspects also playing a big role in how attention then uh, forms the kind of ex uh, attentional experience that we have. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Precisely, exa exactly. Um, yeah, atten it, I, I've been trying to stress in my own internal dialogue and also with other people that I see precision, precision weighting and attention as three different things. Mm -hmm. They are not the same thing, right? Precision is a very technical, mathematical, inverse entropy. Precision weighting is in part informed by precision, but also context. And, and then attention is this kind of optimization of that precision weighting over one tensor. So I think that's kind of useful uh, for people because most people are just used to hearing, well, attention is precision weighting it's like that won't do um i guess to even like confound this problem even more you have you start having stuff like priors over priors so you have like okay i have a prior about the actual distribution of my prior 
But I think the way that Sanju explained this to me, which is really useful, is look at the brain and look how many ridges there are in the brain, right? Like once you start actually folding in these hierarchies, it all kind of makes sense mm. um, why the brain looks like that. So, and I, this is an interesting question, I guess, because of your expertise in, in neuroscience and neuroanatomy. Do you think, so we've now brought like four different priors into the game. Do you think that these are going to look the same? Uh, and what, I know that's a very broad brush question, but what I mean when I say look the same is, are they going to have the same signature of neuronal firing? Are they going to be, uh, is, the, is the neurotransmitter associated with them going to be the same? Or are we just giving a semantic blanket to simplify the situation for something which is going, they're going to be wildly different? Mm. Uh, that's that's a very good point. I mean, the model that we are proposing, this is a kind of functional model that we're saying. We, we, we are not yet sure uh, how it will be uh, implemented on a neural level. But what we can say is, um, I mean, a lot... Uh, uh, a lot of the things moving forward will, will have something to do with uh, uh, dopaminergic innovation, for example, but also uh, other neuromodulators. I think neuromodulators will play a big role in uh, understanding uh, this precision modulating, but not only for inference, but also for, for learning. So um, um, I very much uh, like Chris Mattis' uh, uh, mm -hmm. idea of precision-weighted belief updating, uh, this is a context that he uh, is a concept that he uses very frequently in, in his research, and um, so one prediction would be if um, you have no way of uh, modulating uh, top-down uh, precision, then you're also <laughs> then Sorry. you're not able to uh, issues. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <laughs> then you're also not updating your your prior beliefs, right? If it's if it's just a very fixed uh, uh, belief, then and no way of modulating it by a dopamine, for example, mm. you're stuck. And this is something that uh, actually uh, might take place in uh, in the central medial amygdala, where you have uh, less flexibility. Uh, there is less uh, innovation by dopaminergic uh, regions, and this is something that uh, is uh, yeah. Is, is now, uh, yeah, basically also of interest for uh, for the effects of serotonergic uh, medication that, right. or even psychedelics, that uh, um, neuroplasticity might be uh, actually uh, uh, increased by, by giving large doses of, uh, of serotonin. And this would then uh, allow for re-updating uh, updating, uh, those, those preference priors in, in those areas. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So in that picture, it sounds like the pre preference priors or homeostatic priors you want to call them are higher up than in some ways the perceptual priors. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. That's really interesting because as I said before, to have this flexible updating of your prior in terms of the perceptual belief updating, you have to downregulate your precision weighting over that prior, that perceptual prior, right? In turn, uh, increase the precision over the likelihood distribution of the sensation but that seems to me to be governed at the higher level by an action policy right like do i want to relinquish precision over this prior and maybe in many ways you know we have this idea of rebus um which is carl and robin carl harris's notion that psychedelics flatten out the prior landscape but that's it's a very very neat narrative but which priors right like all of them, at which level? And I think what uh, what I'm really excited about in being an active inference in the community is this uh, notion of deep parametric modeling. The idea that we can't just take one slice of the hierarchy and say that that's sufficient to account for perception or action, right? Because it, it, it runs deep, unfortunately. Um, I wonder, yeah, I wanted to kind of go to your teaching <laughs> when you say, okay, this is a hierarchy and whatever you think is going on at like the perceptual level is going to be informed by the conceptual level, which is going to, and God knows what's at the top. How many, uh, this is a very stupid question, but how many layers do you kind of envisage mentally when you're talking about that? How, where, and, and if you can even say, where does it stop? What's the kind of guiding principle? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely 7.2. Uh, I've heard people. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard people say seven. I'm not even joking. I've heard people say seven. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or seven or eight, or maybe twelve. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I, uh, I'm, now I'm taking on my data scientist hat. Actually, uh, if you add uh, layers to a hierarchical model, at some point you will uh, run out of data to actually process. So you will mm. uh, see that some uh, layers will not process anything. So these mm. are, uh, can go on, can be gone, and that's that's what the uh, nervous system is actually doing. So it's it's removing complexity whenever it can. This is yep. one of the yep. beautiful things of the free energy principle. So if there's nothing to process, they will um, be gone. And I mean, this has a lot in, uh, this also nicely links, for example, to uh, the concept of uh, of meditation, where you say, okay, you basically, dis you want to disengage with your normal way of being in the world, of, you know, acting on the world, having uh, um, goals in mind that you want to achieve. But the only thing that you want to do is just sit there and be there in this very moment. So what are you actually doing? you create a state where you're not pro actively processing anything and you try to you know just calm everything down that you see and what mm. is the experience that you are going to have if you have never meditated before yeah yeah well yeah it's just it's, distraction <laughs> it's distraction and and the the, the 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 effective feeling would be boredom right right, right. So this is some way actually you don't have anything to process at this kind of level. You you feel at yes. unease. You don't know what to kind of do with this kind of experience that you're having. But over um, over a long time, when you're trained to that, um, you will basically, uh, yeah, get uh, maybe uh, um, also this kind of uh, hierarchical layer that would be necessary to actually process this kind of meter meter. Uh, that's having really nice. Some kind of informative. Uh, data and then you get used to it and then you're fine and this is how you can add an, yet another uh, level of the hierarchy oh that's really lovely yeah that's cool uh it's kind of like we're inventing our or, or creating our own markov blankets our mm -hmm. intermediate markov blankets between right. just i mean which we have right already i mean of course we do we're deeply hierarchical beings mm -hmm. but i like the idea that we're kind of we're con it's context contingent in the sense I you know I think you mentioned that actually in your paper that the central amygdala was kind of generally seen as responding to these kind of hardwired appetitive or aversive stimuli right so yeah. a tiger or a mango but actually that hasn't been fleshed out at all in experimental contexts because stimulus stimuli have subjective values. Right, it's it, we don't all sit down and agree with God that we want mangoes and we don't want tigers because maybe you have a pet tiger and maybe you're allergic to mangoes. So okay. maybe it's worth. I don't know if you've got anything to say on that, but like as you say, there are clearly some hardwired ones that we need to be human, right? To be this thing that persists through time that minimizes variational free energy, but there are also others which are downstream on subjective evaluation. Where do you kind of do you see those as two distinct categories with a bright line between them, or do you see maybe the subjective evaluative ones emerging from the homeostatic ones? Where's the what's the kind of interplay between those two? Yeah, always. Uh, when, whenever I start to think about these things, it always looks a little bit like a, a gradient. Uh, so there, there, I think there are no uh, exact boundaries at some, uh, mm. at some point. But I mean, some of the very fixed beliefs we have about how the world should be, I mean, they feel very much real. They, they, they feel like uh, we're losing parts of ourselves, uh, of ourselves if we give up this, um, I don't know, this fact that we uh, seem to believe about the world. So we feel that everything falls down if we have to give it up, even even though it's just something constructed, even show, even if it's just something made up. Right. So. Um, in a sense, you could say that certain uh, um, beliefs uh, uh, have had adaptive value, where you say this might, might be also cultural norms that were uh, transmitted, and, and so um, there might be some, some merit to it. Um, but uh, um, I think it's... Uh, this uh, the, there's, there's there's still this gradient of things that you can easily unlearn and uh, and, and easily uh, update and others where you uh, were holding on a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So now we've been talking about hierarchies and the complexity of the human system and its capacity to adapt. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned in brief in your paper the the possibility of engrams in the amygdala. 
So people associate engrams. I mean, you'll do a better job explaining engrams than I will, but with the hippocampus and with memory. Um, And the way that I read that in a computational sense is kind of almost automated behavior um, and habits and really, you know, strong priors over uh, action. So maybe it's worth starting there with the neuroanatomy because the amygdala is connected. It has a route to the hippocampus. And then saying exactly what you mean, because it sounds like, oh, the amygdala has a memory in some sense. What does that mean? And what does that, how does that add to this already mm-hmm. uh, complicated story? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I'd like to um, stress, because I think this is really important, is that I don't think that there are, um, that there are distinct memory and processing uh, networks in the brain. I think <laughs> when you look at the neuron, you could say, uh, I mean, when you use the computer metaphor, it's uh, it's both it's both the CPU and the memory. So one neuron already does this kind of computation, and it mem it has memory. Right. So uh, sometimes, you know, when we when we write uh, cognitive neuroscience textbooks, we like to put uh, big section headlines, and we call one section uh, memory and the other one decision making, for example. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is already what a neuron is doing. It has its thresholds and it has its memories. And the interesting question now is, um, what does a memory recognize, actually? And um, uh, some of the features or some of the neural computational role a neuron is playing is only uh, played when it's actually, um, when it's spiking, when it shows activity. But there is another aspect. A neuron also... Um, can be totally inactive and already plays a role in that by, for example, uh, suppressing inputs that are coming in. It filters away uh, right. noise. And this is, would be a very energy-efficient uh, way of actually uh, doing neural processing when uh, when it just shuts down things that are not needed anymore mm-hmm. and only propagates those things that are meaningful deviations and then newsworthy for the other parts of the hierarchy. And this is what I am actually mean with uh, memory engrams. So what what would that look like in terms of, because for me, and I I make reference here to this new paper by George Dean and Lars, uh, Sam Bedsmith and others looking at canalized behavior. It sounds to me that actually having kind of engrams or or, or kind of a proto memory system or a memory system in the amygdala could be somewhat uh, pathological in the sense that if it's done you know, non, if it's a non-adaptive form of response, then we have this habituated response that we have no prefrontal cortex regulation over that's freaking out every time we see um, a rope, right? Because I'm like, oh, I think that's a snake or a, fa- or, so a, a face in a rock because I have social anxiety. So what, what what's the adaptive role of these kind of uh, engrams? And yeah, what what's their... Uh, that being so, what's their role also potentially in something like psychopathology? Mm-hmm. I mean, I kind of see myself as also following this idea that uh, brought forward by computer, uh, computational psychiatry people like uh, Klaus Engel Stefan and Carl Fristen and, and Ray Dolan, uh, and also Phil Col- uh, Collette, of course, because sometimes they, they like to uh, reframe pathologies in a way to say, okay, hey, listen, people. Actually, it's coming from a, um, there is some kind of good intention behind this mechanism. Right. So it stays optimal. Act- there is actually an adaptive value of depression, of anxiety, and so on and so on. And in this context, I would like to say, yeah, I mean, it is good to be afraid of certain things. And it's mm. very good to have this kind of stereotypical uh, reactions, those habitual uh, reaction to a uh, stimulus that is coming. If something is uh, dashing towards me, and I will just, you know, raise my arms to protect my face, then this is a very good adaptive response. Even though, I mean, even it might be a train uh, running towards me, and of course my hands will be uh, uh, quite uh, futile to uh, be useless. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's the last resort that I have. It's the only thing that I can potentially do, and maybe it helps me. But, of course, in the modern world, it does not. Mm. The, the thing is, uh, many of these things... Uh, uh, pretty adaptive in, in, in nature, uh, but of course something can go wrong. Um, and the question is, um, 
is it always that it, is it actually going wrong or is, is it something that uh, the brain cannot just no longer adapt to when you think of um of uh of those preference priors many of them in the amygdala i think are acquired during early parts of your childhood. Mm. I mean, this is studied in mouse models and there is um, indirect evidence also in humans for that. So you basically learn uh, what kind of place the world is, whether it's a very dangerous place or whether it's a safe place. And uh, depending on that, uh, I mean, the whole architecture of, of the brain down to the biochemical level will change. So, I mean, uh, gene regulation is a big thing. And uh, the way the DNA is called up uh, around the histone, so how likely it is to, for example, uh, produce stress hormones. Uh, th these are things that are already uh, um, some kind of not determined, but influenced already at this uh, early uh, uh, part in, 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 in development in the developmental windows where those things can actually uh, uh, take place. And then they are there for the rest of your life in a way if not uh, treated properly, if not unlearned in a way. So the thing is, they might have had an, uh, uh, an advantage back then. You know that the world is dangerous, so you should be uh, fast with your stress responses. And uh, so this could be uh, then also the reason for many psychopathologies later on. So some, some people then uh, will um, find when they are grown up, um, different behavioral solutions. So some could be, um, yeah, they are more anxiety prone because they know they are always basically the victim of a situation in a situation. But other people might find that aggression is actually the go-to solution for many things, and um, delinquent behavior can be a consequence from that because they are basically avoiding uh, being hurt by hurting somebody else uh, before that. Mm. Um, but the, the the foundation for that could already be. Um, basically uh, uh, um, ingrained into those uh, into those preference priors that are set early during uh, maturation. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating because I think it adds another level of complexity to this kind of uh, bracketed category that we've been calling preference priors because I think the reason, reason my two cents on this is the reason why something becomes pathological, as you say, in many cases, what we would consider pathological or maladaptive is very adaptive in certain contexts. So in some ways, it's the social context, but it's also the capacity or the consequence of the individual reflecting on their own behavior. And so things get worse, you know, in layman's terms, things get worse if you're like, oh, this is terrible. Like, why can I not go to the party? Why can I not leave my house without checking the door 15 times? And that seems to me that like, What's, what's happening here is that you've got two preference priors fighting with one another. One is one is the higher order one, I would actually say, which is I kind of want to be a normal, adaptive, socially functioning human being. And the other is uh, there's a very high probability of there going to be danger. And then these both kind of feed into the perceptual act and the active act, so to speak. And so you end up with this miscalibrated hierarchy where things are getting confirmed on one level, which is clashing with the confirmation at another level. Which makes me think that there might be some truth in the idea that a sort of adapted human being is one where the, the, the hierarchy is consonant or compatible, the levels are compatible with each other all the way up. So you don't have something like cognitive discord or um, yeah, this kind of, what I actually been calling oppositional self-modeling, this kind of idea that we might be sustaining ourselves at one level, but denying evidence at another level. Just wondering if you have any ideas about that and maybe how they actually feed into the way that we're perceiving and acting. I know it's very complicated because it's hierarchical, so it's always going to be complicated. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. No, I think this is a, a wonderful uh, explanation that you gave already. I mean, if we try to now link it to, to uh, the amygdala model, uh, I think it would be precisely this. You, uh, I mean, you have in anxiety disorders, patients are aware that their anxiety, their experience is excessive and it's mm. not useful what they are having, but they cannot do anything about it. So what they're feeling is a loss of control. I mean, 
first also about their bodily states because um, when you have to say social anxiety disorder, they feel that the heart is racing, that they're sweating, they cannot control the blushing whatsoever. This loss of control actually feeds into their uh, into their feel uh, feeling of uh, of threat, of danger, of terror, of uh, being humiliated, all those negative emotions. So this is one thing. The other thing is also the loss of control that they are not able to change this part of themselves. So they cannot just update their belief to say, okay, but this is fine or this should be fine. Mm. Um, and the reason could be um, that w- w- what, uh, what we were saying uh, um, when we talked about the preference price, you are not able to update them. And for good right. reason, because, I mean, you should, uh, you should learn uh, during your early maturation what the world is like, and you should stick to that because this is something that is apparently useful and you, you shouldn't just update it because you are in a good mood. Like you shouldn't change your preference priors for blood oxygen. If yeah. something is interfering uh, with, with this kind of mechanisms, like say opiates, for example, then uh, the system might break and you, and you might die. The same might also be for this kind of social preference priors of what social signals are dangerous. And, and um, so it's very good that they work very efficiently without you paying attention to it in a very autonomic way. And even if you're stupid, even if you're drunk or whatever in this situation, you should be able to just, you know, update those beliefs and, and, and it should be uh, and bring yourself into, into danger. Great. Yeah, I've got one more technical question and then then we we can leave it. Um, I guess I can't really mentally figure out whether this is what's the kind of uh, what's the kind of mechanism underlying this? Is it because on one hand, it sounds like it's hyper or aberrant precision over the likelihood distribution. And I think this maps onto something like uh, hyperfixation or vigilance because the A matrix is associated with attention. Mm-hmm. And why I say that is, okay, so the, the, the likelihood is, uh, I would, you know, I think of it as Y given X. So the observation given the state, and let's use our sort of, if I've got a snake phobia, if I say that, if I put really high precision over that likelihood matrix, what I'm saying is these observations that I've had is very likely to have come from the state of there being a snake. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I think of these disorders as being rooted in the priors, I might have a hyper precise or extremely strong prior that I can't be in the company of snakes. And so if I get the slightest evidence of that, given my likelihood distribution, I'm, my, my posterior is so divergent from my prior that that constitutes prediction error and a call to action. So there are two kinds of mechanisms going on there. Uh, and maybe that has actually been underpinning my sort of general qualm with the with the notion of prior and the ambiguity surrounding the word prior, which I think has not been really discussed in the active inference community enough. Could you help us see, well, given from the perspective of the amygdala, is it both? Is it one of those? Is it neither? Like, what's what's kind of going on here? That's a fascinating question. And... and uh... I mean, you you are the first one to, to ask me this kind of question, and uh, and I have to say, I also thought about it, and I don't have a solution for it. I mean, mm-hmm. it could have something to do with how we formulate the active inference model. I think this problem um, vanishes if we use a simpler hierarchical Gaussian filter, for example, by by Chris Matthias. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, maybe the active inference model um, or Carl's active inference model got, uh, got a little bit. Uh, over ambitious at some point and, and, and is no longer pure in this very simple computational sense and, and many right. many things were added to it to um, yeah do many impressive things but maybe a, a more vanilla more simple model could actually also help us to to, to figure it out uh, so maybe there is no um, no such a thing uh, as a likelihood mapping uh, that is different from uh, from prior beliefs that we should mm. take care of Oh, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, not yet. So I guess no one knows. I mean, I, the 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 proof will be in the the experimental work and the the triangulation that can come from experimental work and the neurology and the neuroscanning and the computational modeling, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think I think what you show very nicely here is that there's a limit to theorizing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I, to be honest, my perspective is active inference is really in its kind of, uh, it's at its highest moment of strength when it's extremely general. So when I say uh, I'm minimizing variational free energy all the time, yeah, like I'm 100% on board with that, right? Like, And, and for me, that, that way that decomposes into perceptual uh, adequacy and like normative adequacy is is really nice. And the expected free energy equation is really nice. But I guess these questions is, well, you're going to need some deep modeling here. I guess the slight problem is, and this is stuff I've run into when I've been trying to think about these Bayes graphs and modeling the phenomena that I'm interested in. There might be two Bayes graphs which give you the same output. Um, so which one wins, right? Is it just elegance because we want non-complex but accurate models? Is it uh, generalizability? You know, so these are open questions, but I think they're really important to raise in this kind of forum. I, I totally agree. And this was also the motivation for this kind of uh, paper, because uh, at one point we want to make uh, empirical uh, predictions. I mean, what we, we what we're doing in this uh, in this paper at the moment is we post hoc uh, re uh, frame uh, uh, certain explanations that we have in the literature. And I mean, they're all compatible with, with, with the story that we are telling. It's just mm. a new, new way of looking at these things. Uh, but the next step would be, of course, we have to, I mean, we're already making some kind of empirical predictions. The next will be more precise computational uh, uh, predictions where we really look at, uh, at how it could be, what kind of modeling parameters that we use are actually reflected by some changes in the brain or behavior that we can actually observe uh, with the methods that we have available. And then only then we will see if this model is actually useful or if it's just a uh, a nice uh, folk story or something with no relevance for science whatsoever. So this is what we have to f- uh, find out. And I mean, this is also what I tell uh, my, my my colleagues uh, from cognitive neuroscience uh, who w- engage now also in active inference. And I tell them, yeah, we have to make good predictions, empirical predictions, mm. not yet another modeling paper where, uh, where we just show the behavior of some artificial agent doing something. Because nowadays we come to the point that philosophers are making fun of us. They say, okay, we are too theoretical. We are too, too detached from really uh, empirical practice. And we should you know, get, get back to the lab and, and really try mm. it out. So this is definitely the roadmap for the future. Now, first that I conceptualize this kind of um, the, the uh, space of different phenomena that we usually like to uh, think, uh, think of when we talk about the amygdala, how it could actually map to a different narrative. The next will be to come up with a computational model with uh, precise predictions, and then we are going to test it. And I will, yeah, I haven't figured out what kind of architecture I actually um, want to use. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, this so, is fascinating. I mean, the one thing we didn't even mention are the the parameters of some, involved in perceptual updating and like the fact that they contribute. Um, and he- here you can sort of have all your linear equations and stuff, but we'll leave that. We'll leave that to the mathematicians. And I also don't think we're going to solve this problem today. I mean, there's, there's an important thing that I want, want to say as a, yes. a finisher for this, for this last uh, uh, block, because uh, I mean, I said I was so unsure about the uh, likelihood mapping and, and how the prize actually sure. uh, uh, encoded. So, I mean, there's this idea of, you know, Cunningham's laws, you, you get an answer to your question by uh, posting the, the wrong answer uh, to, uh, yeah. to, to a question on the internet. And this is what I'm doing now. I say, okay, no, 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 there is no such a thing as a likelihood mapping. Now go ahead and, and show me how it's really done. And nice. this thing is also applies to this kind of uh, new amygdala model. I don't know if it's the right model. But I, I think we, we wanted to do something a little bit ambitious because what we found was that the typical narrative doesn't add up with what we observe in the human, but also in the rodent data. So I was collaborating with two mouse researchers. And I mean, when I talked to, uh, to them about my ideas of effective inference, they said, yeah, this might be the only way our data could make sense. So there is some, some problem with the existing theory that we're having. And maybe um, we provided the wrong answer. But I think if somebody is able to falsify us, to, to show us where we are wrong, I think we will learn a lot of what the amygdala is actually doing. This mm. will be what the next step. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, no, I, I, I appreciate both the, both the pessimism and the optimism. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and sometimes I just wonder whether it's just 
we're just in a semantic cloud of confusion. You know, whether if we just can have different work, like I've been trying to integrate this word autonomous prior and differentiate it from something like a, a perceptual prior or a hidden state prior. And, and then I, you know, again, as I said, we need to fold in stuff like parameters, the parameters of our generative model and linear functions and the way that this might spit it. Like the Y given X is really complicated, mm -hmm. especially in dynamic stochastic worlds. Um, it's not just like a static hidden variable. So hidden variables. So you're absolutely right. I think, I think the money, yes. I mean, there's this, there's this, um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't know whether humans have the capacity to model these things perfectly and maybe we don't need to, um, science doesn't necessarily work on perfect modeling. It kind of works on effective predictions. And so maybe we need to get back to the lab and do a bit more, oddly go back to a bit more of a coarse grained world, um, where if things work, things work. I, I, I totally agree. So, uh, because I, I think there is no big narrative of what, what the world really is. And there's not one model to, to model the whole world. I think, uh, and this is, uh, I think one of the natural consequences of active hindrance is that we can only go for an instrumentalistic interpretation of what mm. is actually going on. Because anything we observe is always conditional on something. It's conditional on our model, but it's also conditional on our actions. So yeah. we have certain uh, we have so certain preferences. We want uh, we want to achieve certain things, and uh, I mean the minimal preference could be not to die, for example. Mm. And already causes us to inquire and to act in, in a specific way when we're interacting with the world. So there's always this conditional dependency that we should uh, uh, take under consideration. And there is no way of, you know, getting the whole uh, joint distribution. It's always conditional on something. So it's always all kinds of data that we are sampling is sampled for a particular use case because it yeah. does something. That's that's perfectly put. That's exactly what I wanted to say, but for the last hour and a half, but way better said, Ronnie. This was this was amazing. I mean, I, I you know, I oddly expected us to spend more time talking about the amygdala and less time talking about active inference more generally. But I think you're you're one of the you're one of genuinely you're one of the only people I know who was teaching active inference directly on the ground, day by day, and I think that is a huge. I mean, there's huge kudos to you because i can imagine that's not easy especially with the fact that it's updating the whole time we have different schema that we're employing we're chucking some ideas out retaining some simplifying complexifying so thanks for doing that rather you than me i guess i'm doing that in part here um albeit much worse but yeah no thank you so much this was incredibly useful i Again, I leave all of these conversations oftentimes just a touch more confused than when I started. But I think that's a good Socratic sign <laughs> that we're making progress. Um, Je I always ask our, our guests, where can people find you? I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions. I'm, the, the amygdala is a kind of permanent object of fascination for people. So if they wanted to ask questions or find out about the courses you're running, where can people reach out to you? So my uh, blue sky and Twitter handle is sweet neuron. And uh, you can also find my website sweet neuron.at. Yeah, and I mean, I also like to say that I really loved uh, talking to you even for this is uh, uh, recorded here because I mean, it gets so much in my in my uh, headspace and, and talking about these interesting things so yeah i i love this format i love uh, your way of of doing it and it was uh, truly an inspiring and thought-provoking um uh, discussion I oh you're very kind you're very kind i think that might be the best send-off i've had so i'm gonna i'm gonna that's that's made my day uh <laughs> excellent ronnie it's been an absolute treat i've learned a lot i'm confused like last week i'm gonna go take a nap um Thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you for me and the Institute. Thanks for hosting us.